Yeah. 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 Um, on the board. Uh, once the first four questions come with that multiple choice. Yeah. And then it goes to like P5.37. Okay. Is, is that kind of like um, chapter five, uh, question 37? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It should be. So it should course. Like all the questions, more or less, are from the textbook. Um, some of them probably have titles that involve the actual like number of the problem from the book and then maybe others have like more generic titles but there's still problems from the textbook. okay okay yeah. that that would make sense then yeah. maybe um it might make more sense after today's class yeah so oh sure yeah yeah that's right so probably by the end of today's class you should probably be able to do almost all of the homework, if not all of it. Okay, yeah. perfect, cheers, thank you. Yeah.
All right. So I hope you all had a good weekend despite the cold. Um, so a couple of reminders before we get started. First, uh, we have the start of term survey that is to be completed by tonight. So the link is on the canvas shell for uh, Biz 121. Um, and then at some point tomorrow, if I remember, I'll be removing that link. So please get that done tonight. Uh, then homework one, which is just the introduction to Prairie Learn, is due Wednesday at midnight. And then homework two, which is the first like physics homework, is due on Friday. Yeah. Uh, need anything in Wednesdays? I expect that after today, you should be able to complete all of the questions in homework too. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, just a final reminder that labs and tutorials are not gonna be starting this week, they're gonna be starting next week. Okay, good. So what we finished with last time is, remember we were talking about putting these two pieces of tape together and then pulling them apart. And then we kind of tried to figure out how those pieces of tapes interacted with one another. And what we discovered is that when we pull these two pieces of tape uh, apart from one another, one of the pieces is gonna lose some of its electrons. So some of the electrons in the electron clouds that surround the nuclei in one piece of the tape are stripped off and transferred to the second piece. So that second piece acquires uh, more electrons and becomes negatively charged. The initial piece that lost its electrons has a net positive charge because we still have all the positive nucleus uh, nuclei that are, are in that piece of tape. And then what we found, so first of all, there are two types of charges, uh, like charges, repel, and then uh, positive charges, uh, sorry, different charges, opposite charges attract one another. We also found that um, if we took a charged piece of tape, whether it's positive or negative, doesn't matter, and took it to nearby like a control piece of tape, one that hasn't been charged, is electrically neutral, um, that charged piece of tape attracts the neutral one. And it doesn't matter if the charged piece of tape is positive or negative. The idea was that the nearby charge polarizes the atoms in the neutral piece. So if the nearby tape was positive, what it will do is it'll attract the electrons from the electron clouds in the uh, neutral tape. Uh, the electrons are light, so they move, they're displaced easily, but the protons in the nuclei are heavy and they don't really move much. And so you get this net kind of shift of negative charge towards that positive charge, and that's the source of this attraction. That was called polarization. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about uh, another way that we can charge objects. Um, and in particular, this method will work for inductors. Uh, it's going to be called charging by induction. Um, and what's unique about this method is that we're going to be able to charge objects without physically contacting them. So, so far, if we wanted to charge an object, we would use friction. So we rub a balloon on our hair. And so we transfer electrons, say from our hair to the balloon. Um, so that requires physical contact. We're gonna try to come up with a method that doesn't require any contact. And then we'll talk more quantitatively about how charged objects interact with one another. So Coulomb's law will describe the forces between charged objects. Okay, so let's start with charging by induction. And so what we're gonna be able to do is charge 
conductors without touching without touching them. And so in order for this to work or in order to understand this process, what we have to do is we have to know one thing about conductors. And that is in a conductor, some of the electrons associated with the atoms in that material um, are free to move around throughout the entire object. So they're not, they're, these electrons are called conduction electrons and they're not associated with any particular atom. So the material is made of all these atoms and then some of the electrons from these clouds are free to move around, okay? That's not true of an insulator like a piece of plastic or a piece of wood. So it's a special property of conductors. So in conductors, some of the electrons are free to move throughout the material. They are not tied to any particular atom. Okay, so we're gonna to try to make use of that fact. And so here's the procedure. Uh, this charging by induction is gonna be, uh, I think it's a four step process, we'll find out. So step A, the first step is, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two conductors that are not charged initially, and then we're gonna place them in contact with one another. Okay, so let's place two conductors in contact with one another. Okay, uh, in fact, what we could do is let's be specific. And so let's say we take two neutral conductors and place them in contact with one another. Uh, so I'm gonna draw my conductor as a sphere. And I'll draw the second conductor also as a sphere. They don't need to be identical. They just have to be touching. Okay, so this is neutral conductor number one, and here's number two. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw these as if they're like sitting on some kind of stand. And so the stand is gonna be an insulator. And so it's not gonna allow any transfer of charge between the conductor and the stand and any of the surroundings. These stands are just meant to try to give the impression that the conductors are isolated from everything except the contact between themselves. Okay, so these are gonna be some insulating stands. So there's some kind of funny stand that they're sitting on. So insulating stands to isolate the conductors from the surroundings. Okay, there we go. So that's it, that's the first step. Really in a nutshell, the first step is take two conductors and place them in contact with one another. So they're aluminum spheres or whatever you want. Okay, so, in step B, what we're going to do is we're going to have our two conductors in contact with one another and isolated from all other surroundings. And we're going to bring a charged object nearby, but not touching the conductors. So this charged object, this one we're going to charge by, say, taking a plastic rod and rubbing it with some stuff or something like that. And so maybe our plastic rod ends up being positively charged. So bring a charged 
object next to, but not touching, not in contact, not in contact with uh, the conductors. Okay, and so we can draw that. So what I'll do is I'll draw my two spherical conductors. Um, so they're touching there. They're sitting on their stands that are insulating. And then we have some kind of plastic rod or whatever. And we're going to put a positive charge. It doesn't matter that it's positive, but I just have to draw something. So I happen to choose positive. So this is a charged rod. Okay, so the kind of essence of this method of charging by induction is that we're gonna make use of this idea of polarization that we talked about before. But in this case for a conductor, instead of just distorting an electron cloud, for conductors, there's electrons that are free to move around at will. They don't have to remain next to some kind of host atom or some host nucleus. They can just go wherever they want. And so what we're going to have is electrons in these conductors that are free to move around. So I'll just draw a few of them, right? We have electrons in both our neutral conductor number one and number two. And so these are mobile conduction electrons. Well, they could go wherever they like, but they're attracted to positive charge. And so we put a positively charged rod uh, on the left-hand side. And so these conduction electrons are gonna migrate over to the left. And in fact, the electrons that are in neutral conductor number two on the far right, uh, they can actually move over to the first conductor because there's that point of contact between them. Okay. Now, these were neutral conductors, so there's just as much positive charge as there is negative charge in them, but the part, positive part of the charge is stuck in these heavy nuclei, uh, in these atoms, and it can't move around. And so what we have is some fixed positive charge over here, right? And so this is gonna be some fixed, positive charge. So if we have like a migration of electrons from the right-hand sphere to the left-hand sphere, that's gonna leave a deficit of electrons in the right. And so overall, there's been no change to the amount of positive charge. And so if we've lost some electrons, we we're left with some positive charge on the right-hand side. Okay, so the positively charged rod attracts mobile conduction electrons. Okay, and I called this number, this was number two and this one was number one, right? Okay, uh, so therefore, there is a migration of electrons from conductor number two to conductor number one. Uh, so this process leaves behind an excess 
positive charge on number two due to the fixed positive nuclei. All right. So there's a couple more steps. The first step, or sorry, the next step would be to now separate the two conductors. So I don't want to touch them. I don't want to disturb them. So what I can do is I can grab the insulating stands and just separate these two. And I want to do that separation when that positively charged rod is still in place. Yeah. Yeah, so you would have to, what you would have to do is you have to take a more advanced, like condensed matter physics type course. But for some materials, what you end up having, are, they're called bands that you can fill with electrons. And if you have a band that is not completely full, then it's possible for electrons to move around uh, easily within that band. Uh, insulators have completely filled cold electron bands, and so they're not able to move around. But that's that's beyond what I want to do in this course for sure. Okay, so uh, step three or step C, I guess, is what we're calling it. So with the positive rod still nearby. We separate the two conductors. Okay, uh, so what that looks like is we're going to have our positively charged rod. Then we'll have conductor number one over here and conductor number two over here. Now they're not in contact anymore. And so what we're left with is conductor number one is now going to have an excess of electrons because we've transferred some from the conductor number two from the right to the left. Uh, and what we're going to have left over on conductor Number two are these fixed, uh, an excess of uh, fixed positive charge, uh, essentially due only to the deficit of electrons, to the electrons that it's lost. Okay, uh, so we now have an isolated negative, negatively, so this would be conductor number one, and positively, uh, this would be conductor number two, charged conductors. It's important that this step be done while the charged rod is still in the, the vicinity because if the conductors were still touching and then we moved that charged rod away, then the excess negative electrons that are on the left would immediately go back to the right. The reason that they would immediately go back to the right once that positive rod is gone is because all those negative electrons are repelling one another. And if there's nothing pulling them to the right, they will move further apart so that we have equal charge on both sides. Okay, uh, and then so finally, Step D is we can remove the positive, or let's say it doesn't have to be positive. We could remove the charged rod. And so when we remove that charged rod, our conductors are going to remain with their positive charge on conductor two and negative charge on conductor number one. And the reason that charge is remaining is because once we break in that contact between the two conductors, we can't move charge between them. 
right? They're stuck on there. Yeah. Well, those charges eventually dissipate over time. Yeah. It, so in practice, what would happen is in air, we have you know a bunch of atoms and maybe some ions as well. And so especially if it's humid outside, uh, then uh, oxygen molecules have kind of a separation. Their positive charge and negative charge is not kind of symmetric. And so the oxygen would tend to uh, be attracted to these charged objects and they might carry away some, some of that charge. So if, over time, if you were to measure the charge on these objects, it would slowly go down. But if you could in principle do this in like a perfect vacuum where there was no atmosphere whatsoever, then that charge should stay there for, for a long time. Yeah. All right, good. Okay, so, what I'd like to do is get a little more quantitative with our discussion of charges and the interactions between them. And so that brings us to section 5.3 from OpenStax University Physics, Volume 2. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is Coulomb's Law. So Coulomb's law, which describes the force between uh, a pair of point charges. Okay, and so the situation is we want to imagine that we have these two point charges, maybe it's two electrons or two protons, or maybe it's an electron and a proton, something like that. Uh, and they're going to be separated by some distance from one another, and we want to be able to describe the interaction between the two. Okay, so I'm going to draw this as if it is two positive point charges, but it doesn't have to be. There could be whatever you like. Okay, and what we'll do is we'll say that the distance between these point charges is R. Okay, so the first thing we know is that like charges repel. So the way that I've drawn this, these forces are going to act directly away from the line that joins these two charges. So if this is the char, the line that connects the two charges, repulsion means that the force will act along this line and will tend to move the charges further away from one another. So here's this force. And so let's call this charge Q1. And here's charge Q2. And so we would say this would be the force on charge 2 due to Q1. And this would be the force on charge one due to Q2. So force on one due to two. And this is the force on two due to one. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make some observations here. So the first one is that the force is directed along a line joining the two charges. So if I had drawn, say, a positive and a negative charge, it would still be true that these uh, forces act along a line that connects the two, but because they're opposite charges in that case, there would be an attractive force, and so these forces would be towards, uh, like the force on Q1 would be towards Q2, and the force on Q2 would be towards Q1. Okay, so the second observation is that the force is attractive, if we have 
opposite charges. And it's repulsive if we have like charges. Okay, so, so far, there's no new information beyond what we had uh, from last class. Okay, so the next thing that we can do is we could imagine, you know, having some kind of sensitive measurement system that measures the strength of these forces. Okay, so whatever it is, um, let's just imagine that that's possible. So what we would do is we would place these charges a distance r apart, and we would get our little force meter, and we would measure the magnitude of that force. And then we say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make r twice as big. I'm going to take my two charges. I'm not going to do anything other than double r. And then I take my force meters, and I measure the strength of the force. And kind of intuitively, it makes sense that if these point charges are interacting with one another, like that force, that interaction might get stronger when they're closer together and weaker when they're farther apart. And that is exactly what happens. If we double R, we'll measure a force that is four times smaller. And they say, okay, that's interesting. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take R and I'm gonna cut it in half. So I'm gonna make these things closer to one another by a factor of two. And we get out our force meters and we find that the force has increased by a factor of four. Okay, and so we could summarize all those observations by saying that the force is proportional, proportional to the inverse square of the separation distance. Okay, so what that means is if I was to just write down the magnitude of say the force on two due to one, I would say that that's proportional to the inverse of the square of the separation distance. And so this symbol should be read as proportional to. Okay, um, you should be able to tell me something about these forces. What is the, how does the force on Q2 compare to the force on Q1? Yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah, that should be the same in magnitude, but opposite in direction, right? So that that's one of Newton's laws that if object one is exerting a force on two, then two is exerting the same size force on one, but in the opposite direction. And that's not unique to this electrical force. It would be any kind of force, a normal force, a tension, a gravitation, whatever it is. So by Newton's third law, if the magnitude of the force on two due to one is proportional to R squared, then it must also be that the magnitude of the force on one due to two is proportional to one over R squared. Okay, good. Yeah, and and it's a good point. Like it, it doesn't matter if one of the if the charges are identical, say like two electrons or whatever, then that's true. Uh, but we could have one of the charges be a really tiny charge, like a picocoulomb, and the other charge could be some massive charge, like a kilocoulomb or whatever you want. It's still true that the force on one is the same but opposite uh, as the force on two. Okay, so the fourth observation is actually related to this point. Um, if I was to now keep the separation distance the same, but just modify the charges, say I double Q1, when I bring out my force meters, 
I will see that the force doubles. If I take Q2 and I change it so that it's one third of the original ch charge, I'll find that the forces are one third of their original size. And so the magnitude of these forces is also proportional to both the value of Q1 and the value of Q2. Okay, so the magnitude of the, we'll call it electrostatic force um, is also, is also proportional to both Q1 and Q2. Okay, so then we would say the two forces are equal but opposite, and they're both proportional to Q1 and Q2. Or another way of saying the same thing is that they're proportional to the product of these charges. And I put everything in absolute value signs because uh, we're not, this point is not about the direction of the forces. We've already handled that. It's just about the strength or the size of the force. Okay. So if we bring all these observations together, what we've learned is that the forces act on a, along a line that connects the two charges. Um, it's attractive if the charges are opposite and repulsive if they're the same. Uh, and it's proportional to one over R squared and proportional to Q1 and Q2. And if we bring all of that stuff together, we can conclude that the magnitude of the electrostatic force is given by F is equal to uh, Q1, Q2 divided by R squared. Um, and then all we need now is a constant of proportionality. And this constant is called Coulomb's constant. It's often written as a K sub E, the little E, I guess, for like electrostatic. And so this is Coulomb's constant. And it has a value of 8.99 times 10 to the 9. Uh, the way I remember this one is that 8.99 is essentially 9. So it's, it's just 9 times 10 to the 9 is Coulomb's constant. Uh, the units, we have to end up with a force at the end. And so there must be Newtons involved in the units. We divide by R squared. So if I want to have Newtons in the end, I should have my Coulomb's constant should be Newtons times meters squared. And then I have to multiply by Q1 and Q2. Each of those has units of Coulombs. So Coulombs is the unit of charge. And we need two of those so that we end up in the end with a Newton for our force. And so this is Coulomb's law. Okay, good. Now, you'll often see this uh, written in a different way. Um, and uh, I'll just show it to you now. So we often will see Coulomb's uh, constant expressed as a different set of constants. It's just one over four pi times this uh, weird symbol. This is the Greek letter epsilon, and then there's a little subscript zero. So people call this epsilon naught. Um, what it represents is 
So epsilon naught would be Ke times four pi. And if you do that calculation, it, ah, uh, sorry, that's not right. Epsilon naught would be one over four pi times Ke. And if you do that calculation, that comes out to be 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. And it has to have the inverse units of Coulomb's constant. So it'd be Coulomb squared units per meter squared. And so this thing is called the permittivity of free space. Um, the name is not important. Like that's just what people call it. Okay, so we'll see Coulomb's law expressed in both of these ways, and which one we use might depend on the scenario, like what, what's more convenient. So we have Coulomb's law is either Coulomb's constant Ke times Q1, Q2 divided by R squared, or it's one over four pi epsilon naught Q1. Q2 divided by R squared. One thing that's worth pointing out, you know, we were talking about uh, last week at some point that, you know, sometimes when people talk about the beauty of physics uh, is the fact that solving one problem, uh, so once you develop those methods and those techniques, you can often apply them to solve problems in what seems like an unrelated area of physics. So we have that here. I won't, we won't spend any time on it, but I'll just point out that the interaction, the gravitational interaction between bodies has exactly this type of mathematical form. So if we were to talk about the force between the moon and the earth, we would write it down as, instead of Coulomb's constant K, there's some gravitational constant, big G. So let's just say that this is similar to the gravitational force between masses. So if I was to write the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon, I would say there's some constant G, which is the gravitational constant. I don't care what its value is right now. Uh, but then instead of a product of charges, we have a product of masses. So we would have the mass of the Earth times the mass of the Moon. And then we would divide by the distance between them, the distance between, say, their centers. And that would be R squared. And so this is, the gravitational force is similar to the form of Coulomb's law. So if these two forces are mathematically the same, then a lot of the things that we discuss about the interaction between charged objects also applies to uh, the interaction between objects with mass. Uh, <clears throat> one difference, so it's, it's nice to identify those things that are common, but there's also, it's also useful to identify the parts that are different between these two scenarios. One difference is that charges can be positive or negative, but mass is always positive. Uh, the second difference is that like charges, say two positive charges, are going to repel one another, whereas mass, which is only ever positive, that gravitational interaction is attractive. Okay, so the moon is attracted to the earth, and the earth is attracted to the sun. It also means that the sun is attracted to the earth, and the earth is attracted to the moon, and so on. Okay, anyways, that's just a bit of an aside. So what I'd like to do in the last 12 minutes is actually just do an example where we can solve a problem uh, between two interacting masses uh, that have charge, and let's see how it works. So let's do an example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a ceiling here, 
and I'm going to attach some strings to the ceiling. And on one of the strings, I'll have some mass M and some charge Q. And then I'll have a second string of the same length. And it will also have mass M and charge Q. So if these two masses are given the same charge, then they're going to repel one another. And if they repel one another, they will be kind of separated out, making this kind of like B, inverted V shape. And there'll be some angle theta that these strings make with respect to vertical. If the masses and the charges are identical, then we would expect that the two angles with each string would be identical, okay? And so we'll say that this string has length L and this string also has length L. Okay, so the scenario is that we're gonna suspend identical masses M with identical charges Q from strings of length L. And so the question is, find the value of theta. OK. Um, so I'm not going to give numbers. I'm just going to solve this thing symbolically. And I'm going to do that most of the time because I think it's far more useful to solve problems symbolically and then put in numbers at the end than it is to start putting numbers in right at the beginning. Beginning students tend to default to wanting to put in numbers right away. Um, the reason that that's not a good strategy is because if I solve this symbolically, then I can tell you the answer for any set of numbers. But if you solve it only for one specific set of numbers from the beginning, then if I was to change something, say I double the length of the string, or I change the mass by a factor of two, then you have to redo the whole calculation. Whereas if it's already solved symbolically, and I only sub in numbers at the end, then I don't have to redo all of that extra work. Okay, so, what we're going to do is we're going to start by drawing three body diagrams, um, and we'll just draw it for one of the one of the masses slash charges because the the other one would have a three body diagram that looks basically the same. So, what are the forces acting on one of these masses? What's one of the forces? I, yeah, just shout it out. Gravity. Gravity is one of them, right? So gravity always acts directly down near the surface of the earth. What's another one? Uh, so yeah, I heard tension and I heard electrostatic and they're both correct. So we'll put in our tension here and our electrostatic force, which direction does the electric static force act on the charge that I'm drawing? To the right. So if these are identical, uh, charges, they're going to repel one another. And so that repulsive force, remember, acts along a line that connects the two charges. And so we'd have some kind of repulsive electrostatic force. And I'll put that as F sub E. And we know that the magnitude of F sub E is equal to uh, Coulomb's constant times the product of the charges. So if we both Q1 and Q2 are equal to Q, then that's Q squared divided by the distance between them, which is R squared. And so I'll just say that this is R. Okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break these, uh, these forces into components. 
I'm going to choose a coordinate system where I, I'm going to choose kind of a standard coordinate system. I'm going to choose my y-axis to be vertical, and I'm going to choose my x-axis to be horizontal. Um, I made that choice because two of my forces are already along those axes. I have my electrostatic force is along the x-axis, and the gravitational force is along the minus y-axis. And so if I want to separate things into components, I only have one left, and that's the tension. And so I'll have a vertical component to the tension, and I'll have a horizontal component. This angle here is the same angle theta that the string makes with vertical. And so the vertical component of the tension along the y-axis is adjacent to theta. And so we have here T cos theta. And the horizontal component is T sine theta. OK, so that's it. And then again, what I would emphasize is setting this up and drawing the picture like that's all of the hard work. That's where the physics and the thought is. Now we're just gonna do some algebra. So let's see, how are we doing time? Five minutes, okay. So let's do the vertical forces. So the net force in the Y direction, well, we have, in the y direction, we have T cos theta along the positive y direction. That's the vertical component of the tension. And then we have Mg along the negative y direction, gravitational force. Um, so in equilibrium, when we let this go, like what's the acceleration of these masses? Zero. So initially, you know, if they're close together or something and then we let them go, they'll initially accelerate until they find their equilibrium positions, and then they'll just be sitting there stationary. And so there's no acceleration at all in any of this problem. And so this has to be a net force of zero in the y direction and in the x direction when we get there. Okay, and so we could immediately solve for the tension now. So if we isolate the tension, that's just going to be equal to mg divided by cos theta. OK. Let's do the horizontal. So f net in the x direction. OK, well, what do we have in the x direction? We have the electrostatic force along positive x, that's k q squared divided by r squared. And we have the horizontal component of the tension, T sine theta, that's in the negative x direction. So we have Coulomb's law. And then we have minus T sine theta. OK. So we're going to do a couple things. One is we're going to say, well, we've already solved for the tension from the previous step. So I could sub that in. Um, the other thing we could do is we could say, well, I have a right angle triangle here. I'll highlight it here, and then I'll redraw it. I have a right angle triangle where the hypotenuse is equal to L and the uh, base is equal to R divided by two. So let's redraw that same triangle. So we had theta here, this is L and this is R by two. R by two is the side that's opposite of theta. And so it must be that sine theta is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse, or 
it's R divided by 2L. And so therefore R is equal to 2L sine theta. And that's something that we could sub in right over here. And all of this, remember, was equal to zero. And so what we'll do is we'll finish this off and then we'll, we'll be done. So what we are left with is Coulomb's constant, Q squared divided by R squared. So for R, we'll put in this 2L sine theta and then we have to square it. And then we have minus the tension, Mg cos theta for the tension, Mg divided by cos theta, I should say, uh, and then times sine theta equals to zero. And so finally we'll rearrange. Whoops. Let's rearrange so that everything involving theta is on one side. Involving theta, let's say is on the left. Okay, so on the left, we're gonna have divide by sine squared theta is already there. Um, and then we have, let's see, we're gonna have uh, times cos theta. And then we have to divide by sine theta again. So, okay, we already had a sine theta squared, so we have to divide it, we get a cubed is equal to. Uh, what's gonna be on the right, mg? There's going to be a 4L squared, and then we have to divide by Coulomb's constant and Q squared, and I think that's the relationship between, oh, did I get this? Yeah, I think that's right. What we'll do is next time, we'll see if we can make this look a little bit nicer. But if you knew the mass and the length and the charge, you can put all those numbers in and get a quantity, a numerical quantity on the right. And then you can just try different values of theta until you have left side equal to right side and you could find that angle. But we'll work on this a little bit more Wednesday. Thank you. Yes. I have a question about um, homework to 11. Yeah. It's the one where they connect it by an induction for it. I, we tried it for like electrical and we created it, so now we still have any progress on the question. Yeah, sure. Just give me a second to clean up. All right. Maybe take a look. All right.